Good morning, Cross Point Baptist Church. It's great to have everybody back with us this morning for our online service. And I uh, encourage you to get your family, gather around, get your Bible, get your coffee, get a donut, whatever it is that you're doing this morning. Uh, but we're going to sing some songs this morning. Also, if you're watching on Facebook, I encourage you uh, to click the like button, but also click the share button as well. And that way it goes out to other folks that may be looking for another church to attend uh, this morning. Or folks that uh, maybe don't go to church anywhere that are looking for a place to go. So all the people that you know on your Facebook will get that share and then uh, we'll spread that around. I've been amazed in the last couple of weeks. We have people all over the United States that are watching uh, our online services. And so that's a blessing. And so let me encourage you just to be, be uh, thinking of that as we're going through uh, our week and um, inviting folks to come to this uh, online uh, service on Sunday morning as well as on Wednesday nights. So we're going to sing a couple songs this morning. The first one is called Jesus Saves. It's a newer song, but it's got great words to it. And sing along with us if you don't mind as we do it today. Saves, Jesus saves, and the hush of mercy breathing. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, hear the host of angels sing. Glory to the newborn King, and the sounding joy repeating. Jesus saves, see the hearts adore him. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, and the wisest bow before him. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, see the sky alive with praise, melting darkness in its place. There is light forevermore in Jesus saves. sorrow sharing Jesus saves Jesus saves he will die our burden bearing Jesus saves Jesus saves it is done we'll shout the cross Christ has made redemption's cost while the empty tombs declaring Jesus saves Saves, Jesus saves, are the saints who shout together. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, rising up so fast and strong, lifting up salvation song. The redeemed will sing forever. Jesus saves, rising up. Salvation song, the redeemed will sing forever. Jesus saves. Good singing this morning. We're going to have a word of prayer before we continue on with the service. As we do every Sunday morning, uh, we take prayer and we pray for those in our church congregation that are sick. We have a few people that are uh, under the weather, uh, nothing really serious. Uh, but we need to be praying for them. Uh, but also, we pray for our country, especially at a time like this. We need to be praying for our president, praying for Congress, praying for uh, all those that are uh, involved in government services right now. There's a lot, of, a lot at risk here with our economy, as well as uh, with individual people and their families, most importantly. So let's make sure we keep that in a matter of prayer today. 
Uh, pray for our soldiers, those that are in harm's way. We pray for them every Sunday morning. Cross Point Baptist is unashamedly patriotic and unashamedly in favor of our uh, troops. And so we pray for them every week and uh, make sure we pray for those that are still stationed overseas and pray for their families as well. Uh, I'd encourage us once again to just uh, make a matter of prayer for our own church as well. Uh, it's very difficult. I, I love having the online services and people are, are writing in and those kind of things on Sunday morning. And uh, I, I love that, appreciate that. But it's not quite the same as being that called out assembly, that ecclesia. And so we want to uh, just be praying that soon we'll be able to get back together as a church, be able to rejoice in uh, how the Lord's taking care of us, but also be able to enjoy one another's fellowship once again. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll sing one more song after that. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today, Lord. You are a great and awesome and miraculous God. The fact that you would love us is beyond what we can comprehend. Lord, you love us even though we're faulty, we're failing. Lord, many times, Lord, we are willful and stubborn. But Father, yet you love us still, Lord. You gave yourself for us. You died on the cross to pay for all of our sins. Lord, what a blessing it is to be one of your children. And Lord, as the song we just sang, Lord, that the fact that you, your tomb is empty, you've risen, you're coming again. Lord, what a wonderful blessing it is to know that you are the one that saves souls. Father, I pray that you'd meet with us now this morning. Lord, be with our president. Watch over him. Lord, keep him safe. Give him wisdom as he leads our nation. Be with our Congress. Lord, may they understand their the awesome responsibility they carry as well. And Lord, most importantly, be with our soldiers, those that are in harm's way. Lord, keep them safe. May their families always know, Lord, that we as American citizens appreciate their sacrifice, appreciate their willingness to go and do the hard task for us. So Lord, I pray that you'd watch over them. Lord, be gracious to them now. And Lord, comfort them, Lord, and let them know, Lord, that their nation that they serve is truly thankful. Lord, we pray for those that are ailing among us. Lord, those that are struggling. Father, I pray that you'd watch over them. Father, I do pray for those also, Lord, that are economically have been hit hard with this. Lord, I pray that you just watch over them. Lord, may they, they be able to get back up on their feet. And Lord, may our economy come back strong. Lord, we know that our faith does not rest in who is in the White House. Lord, our faith rests in thee. So Lord, we ask you, Lord, that you would, Lord, be considerate and loving and supportive, Lord, of our nation during this time. Lord, may we as churches around the nation encourage their, our communities, Lord, as we share the light of the gospel and the kindness of Christ in everything that we do. Watch over us now. In thy precious son's name we pray. Amen. At our church services here, we sing, uh, usually we sing two contemporary songs and ting, sing two uh, hymns. And one of the reasons we do that is because we want to make sure that the next generation of Christians, as well as those that are newly saved and growing, uh, hear the great doctrine of the old hymns. And the one we're going to sing now is one of those hymns. And the title of it is Power in the Blood. And the fact of the matter is that there is no redemption, uh, there is no uh, payment for our sins except through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we have that as a hope. And uh, so let's sing that from our hearts this morning. There's power in the blood. From your burden of sin, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you our evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. There's power in the blood, power in the blood, come for a cleanse. 
power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Good singing today. If you have your Bible, please turn over to Mark chapter 9. And of course, we've been doing our series here on Christianity 101. I was reading a story this week. It went kind of like this. One afternoon, a man came home from work to find total mayhem in his house. His three children were outside, still in their pajamas, playing in the mud, with empty food boxes and wrappers strewn all around the front yard. The door of his wife's car was open, as was the front door of the house. Proceeding to the entry, he even found a bigger mess. A lamp had been knocked over. The throw rug was wadded against one wall. And in front of the TV, the TV, or the TV was loudly blaring a cartoon channel. And the family room was strewn with toys and various articles of clothing. In the kitchen, dishes filled the sink. Breakfast food was spilled on the counter. Dog food was spilled on the floor. A broken glass lay under the table, and a small pile of sand was by the back door. Alarmed, he quickly headed upstairs, stepping over toys and more piles of clothes, looking for his wife. He was worried that maybe she was ill, or maybe something serious had happened. He found her instead lounging in the bedroom, still curled up in bed in her pajamas, reading a book. She looked up at him and smiled, and asked how his day went. He looked at her very bewildered and said, what happened here today? She smiled and answered, you know, every day when you come home from work and you ask me what in the world did I do today? Yes, he said. She answered, well, today I didn't do it. And so hopefully that doesn't sound like your house as we've been going through uh, the quarantine here in, in uh, our state. Uh, I know that uh, my wife is working from home and others are working from home. And uh, hopefully, in the midst of all this, you've been able to enjoy some family time. Uh, but uh, hopefully, once again, you're, you're weathering this well. And as I prayed, uh, I'm looking forward to when I can see all of you again. I've missed you. As your pastor, I've been praying for you. And we love you. And uh, I know that we have people in our church that are contacting each one of you. And so if you need anything, you feel free to contact them. Or you always know that I'm your pastor. You can call me at any time, day or night, if I can help you in any way. We've been looking at the subject of Christianity 101, and we looked at the idea of prayer and fasting. But here, Christianity 101, Colossians 1, 9 through 10 is the verses that we have taken from this. And we'll go ahead and read it together here. But he says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That's God's plan for us. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. We titled it Christianity 101 because we wanted people to understand it's kind of like going to school. You don't know everything when you first start. But as time goes on, you're taught the lessons. And by the time you get to the end of the year, you're graduated from that. You've learned the lessons that needed to be learned to graduate to that point. And truly, as a Christian, we ought to all be growing. We ought to never reach a point where we plateau or we stagnate, rather. But we ought to always be saying, Lord, teach me more. And so Christianity 101 is along that same thinking and mindset. Of course, the last three weeks, we looked at the subject of prayer. Now, I really, I've heard some good comments about it. I think it challenged us a little bit. And how prayer is often neglected or is not taken as truly seriously as it should in many of our lives. And hopefully this week, while you've been home or you've been working, uh, you've been able to devote some more time to that subject of prayer. But the two things that we're going to talk about, and I've been kind of prompting us in this and letting us know where we're going to go with this, is prayer and fasting. These two things go together. And many times people, they talk about prayer, and you'll hear messages about prayer. But once again, fasting is one of those things that we don't really mention very often. And uh, I'm not sure exactly sure why I got some ideas on that. Uh, but in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, where I had you turn, verses 28 and 29, uh, this story here, Jesus uh, came, came to his disciples, and there was a man who brought his son who was demon-possessed. And uh, they asked the disciples, the father asked the disciples to cast him out, and the disciples couldn't cast him out. 
Now, they, had, they were powerless against this entity of evil. And uh, Jesus was a little flustered with everybody. And he says, you know, how long am I going to be with you? Why are you bothering them? And so Jesus took the man aside and talked to him for a minute. And that's not really where we're going with the story. I want to focus here on this passage here. But um, Jesus, of course, cast the demon out. The boy was delivered back to his father whole again. And what a great miracle that was. And when they went in there, Mark chapter 9, verse 28 and 29 is where we'll pick this up. It says, and when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? They said, why couldn't we cast out the demon out of this boy? And he, being Jesus, said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And let that sink in as we think about this. This kind. What this kind is he talking about? The kind of power that could be called upon in a moment's notice to complete the will of God. The kind of power that would be able to battle against the forces of evil, no matter how difficult it was, and achieve victory. Jesus said that kind of power, this kind, cometh forth by nothing. In other words, it's an impossibility for us to access that power of God. It's impossible for us to access that which we are needed in our everyday life to succeed as Christians without these two things. This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Those two things are important. As we go through our subject here today, I wanna, I'm going to read some things here. It's not in our notes, but... I'm going to read some things. By the way, if you're on Facebook or on YouTube, you can click there under the description. It'll bring up the notes for today. Try to make sure we have that for you each week. You can follow along, print it out, write them in if you like, or just kind of follow along with us. But many times we, we look at things, and this is we are a Baptist church. I always say we're a Bible church before we're even a Baptist church. We're, we're Christians first. Uh, but many times we only focus on what the Baptist denomination maybe thinks or believes without realizing years gone by, uh, there were other denominations that, that loved the Lord and, and, and really were effective, uh, more so even probably, I would say, than even the Baptists at some points in history. And uh, I began to do some research on the study, and, and I'm an extensive reader. I like to read. And I began to read through a bunch of other things here that men of other denominations, great men who God used greatly, and what their beliefs were when it came to this area of fasting. You say, why do you want to quote these guys? Simply because I want us to understand that this is something that's Christian-wide. It's not something that's segregated to a particular type of church. This is something every child of God, every Christian, ought to do. Martin Luther said it this way. Martin Luther, of course, was the founder of the Reformation that took place. It changed Europe and, and brought about the end of the, the Dark Ages and the stranglehold of the Catholic Church. Martin Luther, who nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of Wittenberg, um, Martin Luther, who was greatly used to God for a translation of scriptures as well. Martin Luther said, it was said of him, it says, we've come to the Reformation here. Luther fasted for days while translating the Bible. And here undoubtedly lies the secret to his unrivaled translation. It was also responsible for bringing, once again, that great Reformation. Martin Luther used to fast frequently, and he says this of his flesh. He said, my flesh was wont to grumble dreadfully at abstinence. But fast he would, for he found that when he was fasting, it quickened or made alive his prayer life. John Calvin, who was a uh, founder of um, what we consider Calvinist today, the five points of Calvinism, but a man who was saved, a Christian, a man who was greatly used, said this. He said, that a man who fasted regularly and lived most uh, lived to see his prayers answered uh, in the conversion of almost an entire city. Calvin said this, Therefore, let us say something of fasting, because many, for want of knowing its usefulness, undervalue its necessity. And some reject it as almost superfluous. While on the other hand, where the use of it is not well understood, it easily degenerates into superstition. Holy and legitimate fasting is directed to these ends. We practice it either as a restraint on the flesh to preserve it from lasciviousness and license or as a preparations for prayer. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, who was a Baptist in England, said this, Our Savior added, Howbeit this kind goeth forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. What did he mean by this? 
Spurgeon said this, he said, I believe that he meant in these very special cases, the ordinary preaching of the word of God will not avail and ordinary prayer will not suffice. There must be an unusual faith, and to get this, there must be an unusual degree of prayer and fasting as well. Please notice that Spurgeon's next words were very carefully put. He says, I am not sure whether we have not lost a very great blessing in the Christian church by giving up this subject of fasting. So you see, once again, this isn't something that... that should be regulated to a, a small section of churches. It ought to be practiced in every one of our lives as Christians. So let me ask you, let's just make it a little more pointed here, but when was the last time that you and I truly spiritually fasted? When is the last time you had a spiritual fast? Now, once again, you're at home, so you don't have to be honest with me. I would usually say in the audience, if I had an audience here, I'd say that's a rhetorical question. In other words, don't answer me. But think to yourself, when is the last time I went without food or even went without food and water for a period of time because of a burden that was upon my heart? I spiritually fasted to see an answer to prayer for this. When is the last time you and I fasted over the lost soul of, of a friend or a loved one? When is the last time we fasted for our church or churches across the nation to effectively present the gospel? When's the last time you and I did that? Now, also, I'd just make a note here. There is a psychological or physiological, rather, part to fasting. And let me just kind of put a, a parenthesis here when it comes to fasting. Be sure to check with your doctor if you desire to do a longer fast. And I say this out of concern for your health. In years gone by, there are people, and I, even some of the people that I read and giving you some of those quotes, did fast to their detriment, and they, they fell ill very quickly. And so while there, I agree that fasting is important, and we're going to talk a lot about it today, if you take medications that you need to take, and you can't take it on an empty stomach, or you, you have a physiological uh, problem, uh, whether it be a hypothyroid or other different issues, blood pressure medicines, things, make sure you check with your doctor if you're going to go a long period of time, days without eating. Make sure that you're physically able to do that. And once again, I do believe the Lord uh, wants us to take care of this temple that he's given to us. Uh, as well as being able to fast, you just may have to fast uh, through certain meals and not the entire day, these kind of different things. But let me ask you also, or let me just make this statement about it as we continue on to this. Biblical fasting is not a sacrament. Biblical fasting is not a sacrament. And it's not how we make a deal with the Lord. In other words, where I'm going to go ahead and fast, so God has to do something. I'm going to go ahead and force God's hand. I'm going to, so to speak, paint God in a corner because I am abstaining from food. I'm, I'm putting myself almost on a hunger strike so that God will have to do something. That's not how this works. And we'll talk about this as we go through. But also it's not a sacrament. You say, what do you mean? Uh, many of uh, the Catholic faith and evangelicals even to some degree uh, take this idea that somehow it's, it's benefiting you in a legalistic way or fashion towards pleasing God or getting to heaven. Uh, it's not a sacrament. Uh, what it is, once again, is a tool in our, in our arsenal of offense and defense where we learn to discipline ourselves to the point where we can follow God completely and know his will. Um, it is a result of a burden that, comes, that becomes more important than food or water at times. I was thinking about this, and I... I I don't like to talk about things like this, and you'll see why here in just a little bit, but I believe we're commanded to do our fasting in private, but as your pastor, I would be honest with you and say this, that I've had the habit of fasting over many years. I have, not years at a time, but over the, over the years of being a pastor, I've fasted for days on, on end from time to time or meals. Um, there have been some times, I'll be honest with you, my heart was just so heavy that uh, food just wasn't important to me. I, I just had no appetite for it, and, and the only thing I could truly do was to pray. And uh, I was thinking of, of times when T, Pastor T, the big, tall, bearded guy you saw up here, six foot two, uh, at one time was a little bitty baby uh, here in Grand Rapids, in fact. And uh, he seemed like he always got sick. He had really, really bad asthma. And uh, he would get so, so ill that literally you'd hold him in your arms. We're talking, he's like five, six months old. And he would go, uh, he could barely catch a breath. Uh, and then he would cry, just the most pitiful cry that you could imagine. And the tears would just begin to show on his eyes. And, and it just broke Brenda and I's heart. And anybody who 
has children know how that, how that affects you. And I can't tell you how many times that I would fast and pray for that little boy and fast and pray that God would intervene somehow. And we would go, he was in and out of the hospital. I don't know how many times the first year, year and a half uh, of, after his birth. Uh, before they finally, they put him in an oxygen tent and he would have to stay in there. And then we would spend the night, Saturday night, I'd have to get up and go to church and preach. And I remember how many times I'd get him out of that oxygen tent. We could have him out for like a half an hour, 45 minutes. And Brenda would hold him and I would hold him. And I'd walk up and down the hallways of, of Butterworth Hospital and uh, sing to him and tell him how much I loved him and how much Jesus loved him. Once again, when you're going through situations like that, you're not thinking about food. You're thinking in, in an attitude and mindset of prayer. There have been times when my kids have, at all ages and have struggled, uh, and I've wept, and I've prayed, and I've fasted. Um, once again, not having a desire for uh, food. And I do believe that's the most effective viewpoint of, of fasting, although there could be other ways, and we're going to look at that this morning on how you can do that. But I do believe that when we fast, we get more focused on the need that's at hand. You'll find that when you begin to fast, you begin to focus uh, very keenly on whatever it is that you're doing or whatever it is that you're requesting or whatever it is that you're burdened uh, with your heart. Uh, we become conscious in the matter of, of fasting of our own flaws, our own frailty, and also of our dependency uh, upon the Lord for everything. And so that's, that's the things that, that fasting brings to us, brings our mindset into more of a direct relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ himself spoke and practiced fasting. Uh, we find that in Matthew chapter 4 um, that uh, Jesus did this. Uh, we'll look at it in the later part of the verse, I'll, a later part of the, the message, but I'll read it right here. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, it says, then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. If the son of God himself had the need to fast for a prolonged period of time, how much more so advising for us that we should make sure that we fast. So let's go ahead and begin looking at this. We have three points this morning. I am going to run through them rather quickly, a lot of different slides, so kind of stay with me. When we get to the third point is when the bulk of, we're going to look at the message of the Word of God and look at different instances and stories in Scriptures of how prayer and fasting was used and used most effectively. But number one here, why do most people or many people neglect something that is so clearly taught and exemplified throughout the Bible? This was the forefront in my mind as I began to study this. And I began to realize that all my years of pastoring, and, and I've talked about fasting a number of times and preached a message on fasting years ago, but I remember growing up in church, I never really heard anybody talk or preach a message entirely on this aspect of fasting and how to biblically fast in a proper way. So why don't people do this? I, I, I've written down four reasons why I think there are. And number one is that I believe there, there's fear. There's fear. They're afraid. And you say, what are they afraid of? They're afraid of the unknown. What if I go without food? You know, what's going to happen to me? They're afraid to feel hunger pains to deprive themselves. Anybody's ever been on a diet and had to like skip a meal or had to have a surgery the next day? You know how tough that can be. They tell you not to eat or drink after midnight, right? And at 12.02, you're dying of thirst. Uh, 12.02, you feel like I've got to have something to eat. It's a mind thing. And sometimes, once again, the idea of biblically fasting Causes people to, I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. Sometimes people are afraid that I'm going to start it and then not be able to finish it. Because a fast is really a commitment or a vow to God where you're saying, Lord, I'm going to go ahead and forego this earthly sustenance. I'm going to forego eating or even eating and drinking, say, for a day because this is a burden on my heart. But what if I get to the middle of the day and I can't do it anymore? And so rather than doing it or rather than saying I'm going to do it and then not doing it and causing it to be a sin in my life, I'd just rather not do it at all. And so sometimes people can be afraid of that, or they can be a fear, afraid of, of uh, fasting alone as well. Uh, the enemy has convinced them, the devil has convinced them, or that their flesh could never handle it, that they could never do that. It belongs to somebody else who's more spiritual than they are, rather than realizing the fact that with the Lord's help, they could accomplish it, no problem. Anyone, I'll be honest with you, anyone who's done a biblical fast or done a fast uh, even just in a secular realm, whether absolute, liquid, or partial, would agree that fasting is difficult. 
is not an easy thing. Physically, you'll suffer some uh, unpleasant uh, reactions from time to time. You say, what kind of things? Well, you can end up with headaches. You can end up fatigued. You can end up your, your stomach gets uh, uh, shrinks a little bit, and so you end up having some uh, indestri- uh, intestinal pain sometimes. Uh, as your body adjusts to the calorie intake or the lack of sustenance, and it cries out for more of these things, But I'll also point out this, I think even more so than the physical part, that spiritually, when we set a time aside, we say, I'm going to fast and pray for a loved one who's lost. I'm going to fast and pray for my economic situation. I'm going to fast and pray for a family in the church or a family in my neighborhood that's going through a difficult time, and I want to intercede for them. Whenever we do business with God in a great way, mark it down, the devil is going to come after you. Satan does not want us to have our eyes open to become more focused. He wants us to be blinded by the things of this world. And so spiritually, the attacks can be greater. So number one is fear. Number two, ignorance. Ignorance. (laughs) See, what do you mean? I imagine in the uh, people that are watching today, and we in our church, um, if I were preaching on a normal Sunday, I would say probably 80 to 90% of the people that are under the sound of my voice know what fasting is, but has never been taught biblically how to fast. Uh, they're clueless when it comes to this. And I, I'll be honest with you, I don't blame you for that. I blame me and my peers and those that stand behind the pulpit for not sharing uh, how it is that this, this uh, aspect of the Christian life is so important to us if we're meaning to accomplish great things for God. And so it's not, it's, not a, it's not a fault for you not knowing this, but I would simply say many people don't fast because they're ignorant of how to do it. They're ignorant of, of what it is. You know, they think of fasting. Okay, well, the doctor said I couldn't eat. No, fasting for a biblical sense, many of us have never been taught that. Well, as I said, I grew up in a Bible-believing church, a good church from that standpoint, and I know, never remember somebody preaching a message on fasting. So sometimes just by ignorance. Number three, it can be by the rebellion. It can be by rebellion. See, what do you mean? It? There's, I believe there are many people, many Christians, who are aware of the benefits of fasting, yet, yet they're unwilling to do it. The heart becomes hardened when it comes to the idea of fasting. When God invites them to draw near, they dig in their heels to the ground and position themselves where they say, I'm going to this point, and I'm not going any further. In other words, this is all the farther I'm going, God. They realize if they were to fast and pray, if they were to take a day, say every Friday, and I'm going to fast and pray during the day, and I'm going to devote that time to God and spend hours in prayer on my knees, they realize if they did that, God is going to then turn the mirror of the Word of God upon them and going to show them what areas they need to change if they hope to be effectively used of God. And so they're in rebellion. They say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in doing that. I believe, lastly, it's because there's no desire, though. There's no desire. Once again, it can be by fear. It can be by ignorance. It can be by rebellion. But the bottom line is, for many times, it's just a lack of desire. A lack of desire. Many people have lost their spiritual appetite when it comes to this. John Piper said this. He said, the absence of fasting is a measure of our contentment with the absence of Christ. If we don't feel strong desires for the manifestation of the glory of God, it is not because we have drunk deeply and are satisfied. In other words, that I'm, I'm, I'm as good a Christian as I could ever possibly be. But he says this, it is because we have nibbled so long at the table of the world. Our soul is stuffed with small things and there is no room for the great things of God. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6 puts it this way. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6 says this. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. You see, we will not fast if we don't realize that there have to be a desire inside of us that compels us to drop to our knees, compels us to set aside everything else, including food in our lives, and devote that time to finding the face of God and drawing close to his heart. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Is there a desire in your heart and mind to draw closer to God than we are right now? That's the question I'm asking us. If there is, I believe that fasting is a part of that tool, part of that toolkit as a Christian that can help us to get to that point. Number two here, what are the benefits? What are the benefits of of fasting? 
And uh, in your notes, if you've got notes there, I didn't uh, go into great detail about that. I just, I just kind of left it there with some blank lines. You can pick and choose to write exactly what you want to write there. I'm going to list a number of benefits that comes to that. Bill Bright, who some of you may know who Bill Bright is, he was a founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, was a firm believer in the power of prayer and fasting. Once again, here's another man. In his guide to why you should fast, he had a whole guide, a book that he put together on why you should fast. He listed the following reasons, and I'm going to list through some of the things that he has, and then I'm also going to add some of the things that I had. But fasting is an unexpected discipline that is found in both the Old and New Testament. That in the Old and New Testament, there are both of these things that are found. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse number 6. The Bible says, Therefore go thou and read in the roll which thou hast written in thy mouth, and the words of the Lord in the ears of my people, in the Lord's house upon the fasting day. And also thou shalt read them in the ears of all Judah that come out of their cities. See, what are you trying to say, Pastor? In the Old Testament, they practiced fasting. And in the New Testament, we looked at Jesus practicing fasting. We'll look at some other illustrations of this. But throughout the Bible, from beginning to end, you find that fasting and prayer were a commonplace, even to the point that in the children of Israel, there was a day set aside specifically for fasting that they need to pray and fast. The New Testament church, by the way, back in the infancy of the New Testament church, would, would fast twice a week. Uh, twice a week, usually on a Tuesday or Wednesday and a Friday, they would fast. And this was a common practice in the early church. Now, you take that as compared to how oftentimes our churches, whether it be a local church like ours or even the mega churches that are around our nation, how often do we set time aside at all throughout the year to fast? Fasting can restore the loss, or the, restore the loss of the first love that we have with the Lord and result in a more intimate, uh, more intimate relationship with the Lord. Fasting is a biblical way for us to truly humble ourselves in the sight of God. Now, these are some things that Bill Bright wrote. And I'm going to give you a couple other things as far as how I look at this. I do believe that when we fast, the Holy Spirit has a chance to, once again, turn the mirror upon ourselves. And he has a time to show us truly what our spiritual condition is. I've found in times when I have fasted and prayed and you get through maybe a day or so of the fast and you're on your knees and you're praying, no one else is around. And it's then that you feel the wretchedness of your soul. You see your sin for what it truly is. And you cry out like Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter six, when he says, woe well, me for I am an unclean man. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And I have seen the Lord of hosts. When you are entered into the divine presence of God, you begin to see that reflection and see who you are. And that brokenness comes upon us. And that time of repentance, that true repentance to God, where we come and confess our sins, once again, because we're focused. That fasting and prayer time has focused us, where we say, I want to draw so close to the heart of God that I can hear the heartbeat of God. <coughs> but I also believe the... Fasting brings the word of God alive to us. And some of the times in my life when I've had to make major decisions and I've set time aside to fast and to pray, it's then I find, once again, more focus. And I look in the word of God and the Holy Spirit is able to take me to places that I need to hear and I need to see. Sometimes things I don't want to see. Some things I don't want to hear, but I need them if I hope to be led of the spirit of God can transform our life if we'll let it. Number three, <clears throat> and this is where we're going to focus the rest of our time this morning. When, when should we fast? When and how, I'll kind of put it that way, but when should we fast? So we've got to establish a fact. I hope you've come along with me on this point. So I understand that in years gone by, they fasted and they prayed. And great things were accomplished. I understand that there's benefits to me right now, here and now. If I were to begin to practice this subject or this area of fasting, that my eyes, my spiritual eyes can be opened and I can become more focused on what God has for me and I can, I can uh, accomplish anything that he's placed in front of me if I'm in his will and I feel like his presence is with me. 
But let's talk about the when and how of we should fast. And we're going to look at each bullet point here, and then we're going to look at some verses where we find this in Scripture. But I think, first of all, as we look at this, we need to look at this as uh, when should we fast? We should do it as a private or a secret act. Turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 16 through 18. And of course, you'll recognize Matthew chapter 6. Of course, what were we talking about the last three weeks? And we were talking about prayer. And Jesus has a lot to do in verses, I think it's verse 5 through 13 or 14, that deals with this subject of, of prayer in particular. The first part deals with alms. The second part deals with, with prayer. And now he's going to deal with this subject of fasting. And once again, Jesus Christ is speaking to us here. He says, moreover, when? I'm going to stop right there. You see that word? The second word in verse number 16, moreover, when you fast. Jesus didn't say, moreover, if you fast. See, what are you saying, Pastor? He's stating it as an absolute that every Christian, all of his disciples, should experience this subject of fasting. This is something that's a, it's a basic of the Christian life and being a true disciple of Jesus Christ. He says, moreover, when ye fast. Now he's going to give instruction. He says, be not ye as, be not as the hypocrites of sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. We'll stop, we'll stop right there. Go back up just one second for me. Notice what he says here. He says, <clears throat> they are of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. You picture what this must look like? It's supposed to look kind of strange to people and, and the, uh, the Pharisees in particular, who he's talking about here. But as he speaks to them here, he, sa he says they, they walk around with a sad countenance. They, they're fasting. So they put on their sackcloth. They put some, some ashes and dirt on their head. And maybe they wipe some of the dirt underneath their eyes. And they make themselves look sad and throw some water in their face. So the, 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 the ash and the, the, the mud kind of goes on their face and trickles down. And they walk around just so miserable. And people are like, what's wrong with you? I'm fasting. I'm fasting. So people go, oh, man, look at how, look what he gives up for God. Look at what he's done for the Lord. Oh, my goodness. I wish that, that I could fast like that. Look how spiritual they are. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. Jesus said, he said, no, don't be like them. He said, don't walk around all sad and, oh, I'm so hungry, complaining every time you turn around, having to tell everybody you work with and everybody you bump into, oh, I, I can't eat anything because I'm fasting. Jesus said, no, no, he said, don't do that. That's what the hypocrites do. That's what the hypocrite, because remember we talked about this in prayer and almsgiving. The idea of, of God's not pleased with that. They're not, it's not getting any higher than the ceiling. Uh, their prayers are not going to be answered. And he said, this is what they're doing. They, they want it to, be, uh, to appear to men to fast. And what does he say? Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In other words, whatever they hope to get from fasting, it's whatever glory they get from people patting them on the back. That's all they're going to get. God is not going to hear it. He's closed his ears to it because it was not from the heart. It was out of vanity and pride that they're doing this. They're not humble. They're arrogant. And they're trying to show themselves better than everybody else. And Jesus said, they've had their reward. That's all they're going to get. But notice what Jesus says, verse number 17. He says, but thou, when thou fastest, this is how a Christian, a true child of God should fast, a true Christian, anoint thy head and wash thy face. You know what he's saying? Get up and get a shower. That's how I'm going to put it in the vernacular of today. All right? Get up. You don't have a shower. Get up and get a bath. Get up, wash your face, wash your hair. Huh? Ladies, you can put on your makeup. Hopefully, fellas, you're not putting on your makeup. But you go ahead, get dressed up like you normally would, like it's a normal day. Say, I'm fasting on Friday. My habit and my look should not be any different than it was on Thursday. Because once again, I'm not fasting for other people. I'm fasting for my relationship with God. And so other people don't need to see that I'm fasting. And so my, my heart has to be in the right way. He says, get up, anoint your head, put your cologne on, put your, wash your face, get a shower, get cleaned up, put clean clothes on, that thou appear not unto men to fast. In other words, nobody should be guessing that you're fasting. It's between you and God. They cannot tell from the outward that something is happening where you're fasting for these things. 
that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. When we get a hold of the throne room of God, when we finally have that relationship right where it should be through that area of prayer and fasting, it's then during that time that God says, okay, I'm going to bless you as we should. Letter B. Secondly, as a prayer from the heart, there are spiritual things that are more important than temporal needs. There are things that are more important than temporal needs. David was praying. He had had a child that he was losing. And he was burdened for that child. And he realized that he had done wrong, of course, this is the, with the, with the uh, child with Bathsheba. And for seven days, the child was in between life and death. And finally, after seven days, the child lost its life. The Bible records here about David in this, that David in verse number 16 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. So David therefore besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. David was fasting for this child, even though, once again, it was his sin. And he knew that, and he, he confessed it before God, but this child was going to pay for its life because of David's sin. And so we skip down to verse number 21. Verse number, actually, verse number 20. Excuse me, back up to verse number 20. It says, David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came to the house of the Lord and worshiped. What happened? The baby died, and the people said, well, if we tell David that the baby's dead, he's going to go crazy. And David, when he found out the baby had died, David said, you know what? I'm going to get up and get dressed, and I'm going to go into the house of the Lord, I'm going to worship. Then he came into his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. The servants didn't understand. He said, what is this thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. David's response here is very interesting. He said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him but he shall not return to me. So throughout this process, you see David's fasting in his prayer. And when you have this kind of prayer, this is a prayer from the heart that spiritual things are more important than temporal needs. For seven days, David fasted and prayed for the interceding for the life of his child. He was telling God, you know what? There's something more important that I need to get. They, other people tried to get him to come and eat bread. And he said, no, I'm not going to do this. I need to make my point here. I need to, to learn to self-discipline myself. Because it was his lack of discipline that caused the sin. I'm going to stop here with this right now. We'll pick up some more points next week as we close this down. But I'm going to ask you just a couple things to be thinking about as we go into next week. I want you to ask you to think about, Lord, what can I, or what could or should I be fasting about? What are some things that I should be focusing on and fasting for? And let the Lord kind of give you direction and guidance in that, in that regard. Now, I know this subject may be a little deep for some, and I'll, I'll readily admit that, and I, I apologize for that in one sense, but I don't apologize for the message in the sense that I believe it's something that needs to be taught, and it is a very basic part of the Christian life. But let me encourage you to do this as well, is to realize that God has great things in store for you, and he wants to do great things in your life. I would encourage you to think about this as you go through the week and pray and say, Lord, help me to understand this area of fasting and prayer. The two of them go hand in hand, fasting and prayer to be able to have the calling of God upon my life as it should be. Let me ask you to think about a couple of things here as I close this out for today. Do you know Jesus Christ is your savior? Are you certain if you were to die that your home would be in heaven? See, we've been talking about prayer and fasting. The one prayer that God desires to hear from us as sinners of which all of us are born sinners, is, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Take me to heaven when I die. I know you are the Messiah, the Savior, and you've died for my sins. Lord Jesus, please receive me into your family. You see, when we come to him with that John 3.16 mentality, he receives us no matter where we are, no matter what we've done. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Do you know for certain if you were to die that you would go to heaven? You can know that today by simply calling out and asking Jesus Christ in prayer for forgiveness of your sins. I want to encourage us to be thinking 
of these things as we move forward. I hope that next week you'll join us and that we'll have an opportunity to continue with this series. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the blessing it is to be, Lord, to meet together. Lord, if there be one here today that doesn't know you as Savior, Lord, may they today, Lord, make that decision right there where they're at, at the computer screen, Lord, they would stop everything, Lord, and realize that they are lost and without you and that only you can save them. Lord, you loved us so much, Lord, that you died on the cross for our sins. If there was any way for man to pay for his own sins, Jesus Christ did not need to come and die. Lord, but because we are all born sinful and we all need the Savior, Lord, you came and died for us. I pray, dear God, that we would listen to the Holy Spirit inside of us now. And Lord, if there are those that are unsaved, Lord, may your Holy Spirit convict them. And may today, Lord, they call upon you to be their Savior. Watch over the rest of us as well, Lord. May we understand this importance of prayer and fasting, how deep this is, but how vitally important it is, and what a lost thing it's been in our fast-paced society. Lord, may we recognize, Lord, the importance of it. In thy precious Son's name we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, ties here, and then we'll have a closing song here. I, I spoke with the advisory committee um, this week and uh, our advisory council rather and we talked about this the fact that um, offerings are kind of all over the place right now and that's the same I think with probably every church that you're at uh, but I'd encourage you to be thinking about uh, giving online uh, as well as giving um, through the mail we've had people that are doing both I just want to kind of show you a quick graph here if I can have that thrown up here and if we could kind of focus in on that, Jacob, I'd appreciate it. Um, what I want to do is kind of give you a basic breakdown so you understand. Now, we're not destitute. We have money and it's in the savings, so praise the Lord for that. Lord knew that before we got this started, so I'm thankful. Uh, but this is in, as of March 2020. The, the top part there is our weekly budget, weekly offerings, and the difference. In other words, our weekly budget is 2500 a week. Our offerings that came in were about $1,060 less than what our, our note just for the week. Um, and then as far as from March 2020, the monthly budget for the month of March is going to be $11,075. Our monthly offerings are only $7,637, which leaves us short uh, in, in the red $3,438. Uh, now, you can understand, too, that, I, and I do understand this, there are people that are out of work. Uh, people that uh, are on going filing for unemployment. So I'm not blaming her. I just I want you to be able to see kind of what we're seeing, so that you understand. And so uh, I'd ask you just to pray about this. Uh, be faithful. Part of what's in here as well is our missions. Uh, and so the missionaries they rely upon this for their food and uh, for their bills across the seas. And so just be thinking of, of making sure, especially with missions, that we're giving towards that. If you'd like to give for benevolence, we've had a couple people that said, hey, I'd like to help out with people in our neighborhood. We've had to help some people in the church uh, that are struggling right now. If you'd like to do that, you can do that online. Just click on other, and uh, we'll make sure it goes to the benevolence fund for that. Uh, we had a, a family or a man in the community, a businessman in the community, uh, about a month ago that uh, wrote a check uh, and gave it to the church. Uh, towards benevolence and I praise the Lord that God touches the hearts of people when he does because we have the finance to be able to help with somebody with this now so I encourage you to do that we had to help some people yesterday as well so maybe if God touches your heart and you can help with that these are two ways you can go ahead and mail the offering to 2290 Suite A 28th Street Southwest Wyoming Michigan 49519 and just put on their tithe or whatever it is you like to put on their tithe or missions split it up how you like or you can go online uh, you can go to our website uh, and click on give and there's actually a button there on the top one. Click on that, and it will drop down uh, towards uh, giving. And then you can kind of set it up to either to give one time or give reoccurring like every week or every month. You can set up however you'd like to uh, until we all get back together so that the finances of the church are still taken care of. So I don't like to preach on, on giving. I feel like we've talked about it enough in the last couple of weeks. Next week, I'm not going to say much about it at all, but I felt like we need to kind of I need you to see what I'm seeing. Uh, and realize that to keep the lights on and keep everything else going uh, takes the financing uh, that is brought into the church. So 
Help us with that. Pray and let God direct you. If you don't have money, like say if you're out of work or you're on unemployment, don't worry about it. God's, God's greater. He'll take care of all of it. So as we're going to sing our last song and then we'll be dismissed here. Um, one of the things that uh, I'd like to say to you is I love you. And once again, as, as your pastor, I miss you. If you need anything at all, and you're a little short on cleaning supplies or short on groceries, please do not hesitate to call. We do have financing to be able to help with that. And uh, we don't want anybody to go without. Hopefully you're being contacted by your group leaders, your life group leaders, as well as some other leadership in the church. They're leaving messages for you. I'm trying to leave a text for you as well once in a while just to know that we're among the living. Everything's okay. Uh, but I love you, and uh, we're so thankful to be serving with you here at Cross Point Baptist Church. And hopefully, once again, we all get back together. Uh, we'll see a great outpouring of that fellowship and friendship and love again. So let's go ahead and sing our last song, Growing in Grace. That's a theme for our year, and then we'll be dismissed. Growing in grace as we run in this race that Christ has set before us. Living our lives to the glory of Christ. Together we will grow in his grace and the knowledge of Christ. To him be the glory both now and evermore. Seeking his face here in this place, we are growing in grace. We are growing in grace. God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you on Wednesday night online. We'll do Facebook Live or do Zoom as well online on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. God bless you.